has to do with case arguments, I believe. Okay? And the first thing we're going to do is tell you one surefire formula. There are very few in all of debate. Like, in debate, there are kind of some rules of thumb, but then you should ignore those. Yeah, close that because that's loud. Thanks. Uh, you should ignore them, you know, when it's appropriate and kind of figure out when it's appropriate is the tough part. And debate is in general an art and not a science. You know, it's not like a chemistry kit. We can give you kind of these instructions. You follow it and then you'll automatically produce the right combination of, of stuff that'll work. Okay. But in this instance, there really pretty much is you know, an almost absolute formula. There could be slight variations on it, but I mean, you might as well just follow the formula. Okay, so when it comes to extending a case argument, okay, extending a case argument. Now, this is an argument that starts out in the 1 in C, right? The 1 in C has a list. Now, it's also a general rule that wherever the list is, that becomes the signpost for that argument that henceforth in the debate. Okay, so if it's 2AC answers to a critique or answers to a dissat or answers to T, the 2AC makes the first list, right? So that list always becomes kind of what people refer to signposting-wise. But in the case of case arguments, Right, you had the one AC, which had some description of an advantage or their solvency or whatever, and then you have a list of arguments in the one NC that answers that. Okay, everybody's with me because this is real simple. The two AC comes along and does any one of a number of things. Right, sometimes they kind of group one and two, and they say a couple of things. Sometimes they say, well, off number three, here are my three answers. Okay, sometimes they say, you know, they say number four, but hell, the 1AC answer it, answers it, okay? So the 2AC kind of runs through this in some form or fashion. Now, what you want to do in the negative block on case arguments, okay, your goal is to win them kind of once and for all. Okay, so there's a good formula for how to do that. Okay, you want to choose from this list. And this list might not just be four items. You know, there might be six, however many, seven, etc. Okay, you give yourself choices by presenting a number of arguments in the one and C. Okay, and in the negative block, and notice I'm not saying that one and R or the two and C. I'm saying in the negative block, right? You choose from amongst these. And you make your choice based on, obviously, how strong your argument <coughs> is versus kind of how weak their answer is. Okay, but you can't just start with kind of a weak argument of your own and say, well, they gave a weak answer. So what? It's like your argument got what it deserves. So it has to be kind of an argument that you can in some way say, hey, this is meaningful. This really undermines their case advantage. This undermines their solvency to some significant extent. So, you choose, and to extend, somebody asked about extending in some lecture, really like the first day, I think, uh, extend. What does it mean to extend one of these? And how do you do it? There's a simple formula. This is going to be one of the quickest, nicest, most simple things you'll ever get. Okay? So if we want to extend, let's say number three, whatever it is. Okay? Here's how you do it. Okay? Step one. <coughs> refer. By name and number. Okay? Hopefully you did number these basic arguments in the one in C. Referring to the argument by name and number, saying extend the one in C number three, okay, and then just the basic name of the argument, the tag. Remember we said you should have tags. They should be things that are brief that the judge can write down, not like long-winded explanations 
that somehow the judge is supposed to figure out what the tag is from it. It's a label. The arguments have labels. Okay? And you simply say, extend this argument, whatever it is, label name, and number. Okay? Sometimes the judge doesn't have the numbers straight with you, or doesn't have the name straight, but if you do both, okay, odds are that'll clear up anything. Okay? Everybody with step one. Okay? Too many of you don't do step one right. You just say extend one and see number three, and then you start saying stuff. Or you say, you know, extend our, you know, local implementation fails. We don't know where local implementation fails was. Okay, or you'll say some other name that's different than the name that the argument had the first time. Okay, it should be the name the argument had the first time. Okay, so this is easy. This is that easy button you can push, right? As long as you just do it right and you do it consistently, round after round after round, you don't you can develop a habit of how you're going to do this. Okay, even though some people don't. <laughs> But this is easy. There's no excuse. So tomorrow when, you know, I or Dave or whoever, I mean, I guess we're going to have some of these drills and we'll kind of divide up and listen to you, kind of extend case arguments and answer them back, have these mini debates. Uh, when we hear you, you know, this is item one we're going to hear. Are, are you kind of referring to the argument that you're extending kind of by the name and number? Okay? And... In order to do that, of course, the damn thing has to have a name and a number, right? It can be the Dave argument, you know? We number three, Dave. I don't give a shit what you call it, okay? It's, oh, whoops, that's being recorded. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, Dave, do you know how to censor out bad words in this yeah, thing? I can do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't particularly care what you call the argument, okay? <laughs> it needs to have a name, you know? Once we know Dave, and then we know when we say Dave, you know, you're talking about kind of the really old guy, you know, with gray hair in the lab. Okay? We, we know that, that that's who we're talking about. Not Ross, you know, not the young, vibrant guy. Okay. <laughs> so, step one. How easy is that, right? Step two. And here's where a lot of you go really wrong, even if you get step one right. Step two, a lot of you d dive in and start saying, they said this but that. Guess what? The coach doesn't really know, or the judge doesn't really know Dave that well, okay? And so for you to start talking about the answer to what they said is premature, okay? Step two is to explain your argument. Let's hear something about Dave, or whatever your argument is, okay? What is your argument's reasoning? What is it saying? Okay? There's only one time on the negative, in the whole debate, when the negative team gets to explain things. And that's in the negative block. The two and R doesn't have time to explain stuff. Okay, the one in never takes time to explain stuff. They just lay it out there. There's one and only one time for explanation when you're on the negative, and that's in the negative block. So if you don't explain it now, it's never going to be explained. It's never going to be understood. The judge doesn't know all about Dave. The judge doesn't know all about your argument. Okay? You want to explain your argument. Okay? Now's the time to answer their arguments. Not quite yet. Although you're a lot closer. If you explain the argument, that creates a context, doesn't it? That then I can judge their answers in light of what this argument means. You see that? If I just kind of have a label, or a label and a number, then you start answering their, your opponent's arguments. The judge has no context to say, hey, is that a good answer or a bad answer? Okay? Explain. The third step adds a little to this. Let's find out how good our argument is. How sweet it is. Let's, yeah, let's, let's call it that. How sweet it is. Okay? How sweet it is. This is a great argument because. Okay? It might be because you have great evidence. We have, you know, a fine author, you know, who's a professor. 
you know, who gives three reasons to believe this argument. It's based on empirical evidence. Like, what makes this argument kind of really kind of a really good argument? Okay? Why is this a good argument? Okay? And then if we know that our evidence is from a professor who's using empirical studies, okay, what does that give you? Any answer that they give that's kind of not based on good evidence, you know, or empirical studies, you say, and they say, okay? So you create all this context. We want to know what your argument is. First of all, where it is on the flow, what it is, and how good it is. Only then do we have a framework for comparing your argument to your opponent's answers to it. Okay? Step four. Answer line by line. What that means is answer each one of what the 2AC said individually. Okay? <coughs> And so you can, and the simple formula there. You know, you say, all right, it's great from this blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, and they, okay, say, now, you got a word you can insert here when they just give one answer. All right, and that word is just. And they just say, okay, what does that do? That creates an immediate contrast between the quality of your argument okay, and the quality of the answer. Okay? And they just say, blah, blah, blah. And practically, by saying they just say, you've answered what they've said. You've already kind of created in the judge's mind that the response was not worthy of the original argument, that the original argument that you made is stronger than the response to it. Okay? Now they may say multiple things. So you, get, you say, and they say first that their 1AC Jones evidence answers this. But they say blah, 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 but. So this is like a formula. You can just fill in the words. But, you know, the Jones evidence is not qualified. The Jones evidence cites no empirical evidence. The junk, you know, then you're just making contrast with your evidence. Okay? And the Jones evidence doesn't even speak to this issue. The Jones evidence is about transportation help in general. Our evidence is more specific. It's about what the plan actually does. Okay? Whatever, whatever the contrast is. Okay? You know, then, you know, next they say, blank. You just run through the arguments. Sometimes you can say, and then they say such and such, but that's obviously irrelevant. Why? Because you, then the judge kind of like nods their head, yeah. That's obviously irrelevant, because now the judge understands what your argument was. So that when the judge hears you repeat what their answer is, and then you assert that their answer is irrelevant, the judge can immediately, because they're smart, like, you don't have to be that damn smart either. Like, the judge can be fairly dull, but still get the idea that, hey, guess what? That was not a relevant answer. Okay? So you can be really kind of quick going through what they said. Now, if their answer really kind of is on point, then you need to read a card to answer something they said. Nine times out of ten, the two AC is not really going to have that powerful response. Like the lost art of case debating uh, is a lost art for both sides. <laughs> uh, but if you kind of get up to speed on the negative, those two ACs can be really be punished. Two ACs think they can just breeze through kind of the case arguments. Okay. Now you might be saying to yourself right now. I can hear you. Oh, but Russ, this is like taking so much time. This is time consuming. To hell with you. <laughs> First of all, remember we're not extending every one of our lousy arguments here. We're extending the good ones. Okay. We're choosing, and then we're really making them count. Okay. Secondly, the negative block does have a lot of time. Okay. Let's cash it in. Okay. It's time to cash in. Our chips, right there. Okay? So step four is answering line by line. You basically know how to do that. But a lot of it gets to be really easy because you use the explanation and you use how good your evidence was in your answering. If instead you just went straight into the line by line and said, 
you know, they say that they're wanting to see evidence, but our evidence actually answered this. Because it's like, it's a mess. The judge doesn't know what your evidence actually said. You know, they don't know what their evidence said. Establishing this other makes this line by line part really relatively quick. Okay? And then step five is to impact the whole thing. When I say impact, it doesn't mean like the impact is nuclear war. What it means is impact it in terms of how it figures into the decision in the debate. Does this totally eliminate their solvency? Or does it like really significantly reduce their solvency? Or does it really significantly reduce this advantage? Does it take this advantage out completely? Does it turn this advantage? Like, what's the function of this argument kind of in the balance of advantages versus disadvantages in the debate? Okay? Impact it, okay? Impact it in terms of the decision. You know, in terms of the decision calculus of the debate. Now, there's one item I left out. I left it out on purpose. Because it's kind of optional. Okay. Sometimes you have, you didn't read the best card or whatever. You might feel like you need to read more evidence on something. A, you don't need to read more evidence if you read good evidence the first time and what they, they answered with wasn't that good. It can only get you in trouble because now it kind of gives them authority to come back and, you know, well, since you read this other evidence, then that makes it kind of a newer issue and we can kind of come back in the 1AR and read more evidence and get our act back together on this. So sometimes you don't really want to. Okay, but other times you might have another card that kind of supplements, you just kind of started the debate out on this, and there is something else that really makes it an even sweeter argument. Okay, how sweet it is, you can often insert that extra evidence right in here. Okay, and it's so good that there's also this other evidence. Okay, or sometimes you can do it right before the impact stage. Now, if the evidence really is on point to one of the answers that the 2AC made, like I said, then you should do it in the line by line where it belongs. Okay? But this is a five step formula, okay, which there should be no departing from. Now, what you could do to prep for your debates, these practice debates you're going to do tomorrow, okay, try to look through if you're on the negative. Or maybe you're going to be both. I don't know. How does that work? Well, so for when you are negative, extending some of these, okay, try to look through this list of arguments you're going to make and say, what are the strong ones? What are the ones that are kind of, I think are kind of good here, that really the 1AC doesn't answer that well, that I think have, and strong means kind of has some good impact in terms of what it does to the decision calculus of the debate, you know, something that actually will make a real dent in the case advantage. Okay, look for the strong ones. And in prep, you know, tonight or whenever, you can kind of make sure they have a good tag, <laughs> you know, that's memorable. You can write up a little explanation of the argument. Okay? Now, the one thing about it, you don't want to whiz through the, read that explanation at top speed, and then the judge doesn't even understand that. Okay? The explanation has to be, you know, conveyed. <laughs> okay? And write up a little thing about how sweet the argument is, about how good the evidence is, whatever. You know, prep that. Okay? Then whatever they say, then, then you can kind of do steps one through three, have them kind of ready. And if you have an extra piece of evidence you might like to read, you know, you can have that ready. You know, and then all you have to do is just analyze what the half answers are. And you can kind of have the impact thing pretty much ready. Okay? So these are things that you can have prepared. And you can make real dents in affirmative advantages of solvency uh, if you follow this model. <coughs> the sweetest thing about this, okay, is, and you could also add, you know, and no new answers, you know, at the end of this, like, right? No new answers. You know, 2AC had their chance. The sweet, really sweet thing about that is that it does become obvious if the 1AR brings up new arguments, because you've kind of spelled out everything. Second sweet thing is that it saves the 2 and R tons of time and trouble. What you're doing here is winning this part of the debate right there in the negative block. 
Okay? So there shouldn't be anything kind of new that can happen. Okay? And if you're the one in R doing this for your two in R partner, the two in R can catch up to the debate this way. Right? The two in R is kind of by writing down what the one in R said. Hey, this is the argument. Here's the explanation. The evidence is good because they said this and here's the answers. Okay? The one in R kind of helps the two in R out. And the two in R will be much more willing and able. Okay? Sometimes the two in R is plenty willing, but they're just not able. They don't have the prep time. They haven't spent their time paying attention. They couldn't for whatever reason. Okay? But able and willing to go for the argument. Because you've also said how it impacts the debate, you know? So the two in R can use it. It makes something usable if, if the one in R is extending it. If the two in R is extending it, the two in R quickly and the two in R can just refer back to it and say, look, you know, we blew them out of the water on this in the negative block. Okay? The only answer the one in R said was the same as the two AC number two. We already explained how that's not relevant because the Jones evidence is way better. And you can just kind of really briefly refer to it and say, I don't have to repeat myself. You know, the judge will know. <laughs> you have to trust that the judge kind of got the fact that you spent all this time kind of obliterating these arguments. Okay, and blowing something up and making it real and meaningful. The only time you win debates on the negative, okay, is in the negative block. And okay? you could lose them back in the 2 and R if the 2 and R doesn't refer to the negative block and how it won well enough. Okay? But you just can't win a debate like that you're not winning in the, in the negative block, in the two and a half, it's impossible, okay? This is the only time you can do it. And so if it's gonna be a case argument, it's gonna be part of a winning strategy, then it has to be completely explained. The argument has to be comparative, and it has to be impacted. So we got ex explanation, uh, develop our argument, compare, that's that when we answer their thing, and then impact. All right, simple formula. Anybody have questions? Think that's wrong or crazy? Say so, because I know sometimes people just say, well, Ross said to do it this way, but somebody else told me to do it this way, and so, you know, it's optional. Where I'm from is often how that starts. What's that? Where I'm from. Where I'm from, yeah. Where I'm from, they don't do it that way. Or some judge told me to do something else. Anybody give you other, any other advice some, at some point in time? Right. People don't talk about this much at all, really. So people don't get good, good coaching on this, uh, sad to say. But the uh, <clears throat> fact of the matter is not enough good college or high school debaters, successful ones, even do this. Uh, so if you do, you know, it'll make a huge difference in your life. Trust me, when you're at least answering the case life, <laughs> that little part of your life. And if you're a total debate geek, that part of your life is important to you. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, everybody write down the formula. You know what it is? Okay, good. We're going to switch gears now. It's going dark. Uh.